I'm going to start recording this. All right. All right, and God bless y'all. We know that there's some other people coming, but we'll go ahead and we'll, we'll pray. And then we'll, uh, we'll start on this. We are going to finish up chapter 17 today. And then we'll, uh, we'll move into 18 a little later on. But let's, let's go ahead and pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this time to be in your presence. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that you are the covenant God who acts according to your word. And what we read here is not just history of the past, but Lord, it's your promise to do even now what you did then. So Lord, we just pray open eyes and ears and heart to receive from your word and Holy Spirit be our teacher now. Show us what we need to know. Help us to apply what we learn. And Lord, let it be a blessing to your kingdom. Let it glorify the name of Jesus. And let it be salvation uh, to those divine appointments that you give us to share the word. And let it be salvation for us as well. Lord, that we may walk ever closer with you. And so we just ask this in Jesus' name, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Amen. Molly and Elizabeth. All right. Well, it's good to see everybody here. And I have, um, we're going to start at verse 16 of Acts 17. Okay? And what I'll do is uh, I'll go ahead and just read. If it's okay, I'll read the uh, 16 through the end of the chapter. And then we'll, we'll go through what we're, what we're seeing here. But that's uh, Acts 17. And we'll start at verse 16. And like I said, we do have a book for this. Uh, the problem is that, that this portion of the lesson that they have uh, doesn't really delve very deeply into a lot of this. And I, I, I really don't feel like we should be missing or, or just going over this very lightly. We need to, we need to see more. So we're going to do that. So anyway, we'll start at verse 16. And we'll see where the Lord leads us in. Right. Now, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue of the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus at the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? For you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For I passed along and observed the objects of your worship. I found also an altar with this inscription. To the unknown God. Which, by, by the way, as I, I think I said last time, uh, they were doing a dig in Athens and they found that. They, they found that all. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined a lot of periods and boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God in the hope that they might feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. For in him 
we live and move and have our being. As even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Now, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. But others said, and we will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their midst. But some men joined him and believed, among whom also were Dionysus the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. All right, so that's the end of that portion of the reading that we have. Now, the first thing that I want to draw our attention to is what we find here in number one. Uh, we find in, uh, in verse 18 that among other people, Paul is speaking with Epicurean and Stoic philosophers. Athens was the, the, the city uh, that really epitomized what, what Greece was all about. It was all about philosophy. It was essentially a university city, if you want to put it that way. All they talked about was the new philosophical thing that somebody had thought up in their head. And what you have with the Epicureans and the Stoics are opposites that uh, will, will actually uh, cause great problems or challenges to the gospel when the gospel is preached. The Epicureans, on the one hand, were those who believed that you could find peace and happiness by living it up in the world. In other words, uh, gluttony was no sin. Drunkenness was no sin. Sexual immorality was no sin. In fact, there is no afterlife, so all that you have to do in this life is to make yourself as happy as you can. Therefore, just live it up, enjoy yourselves, have a great time, and really do everything that you can to, to uh, entice your flesh so that you can you know really have it all have it all now because the way they viewed the afterlife was that the afterlife was simply everybody's in Hades and there is no heaven and it's all darkness and no joy there since that's where we're all going you might as well enjoy your life now in other words it's like what Solomon wrote in uh, Ecclesiastes, eat, drink, and be merry. And that's something that Paul quoted also. If there is no resurrection, if there is no heaven, if Jesus isn't alive, then yeah, just eat, drink, and be merry because there's no heaven to go to. There's nothing better than here. All right? So that, that's basically their philosophy. Eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow you're gone. So just, we're going to live it up. On the other hand, you had people called the Stoics. And the Stoics were those who believed that, that the way to happiness and peace was, was to reject all pleasure and, and reject all happiness on earth. In fact, it's, it's all an illusion. And in fact, they, they, they came to the point where they were saying that anything that's created and makes you feel good is bad. Actually, it reminds me of some doctors. You know, they, if, it, if it tastes good, spit it out. It's bad for you. And, oh, okay, that's a joke. <laughs> but, but you know, like if you like your if you like your double cheeseburger, smothered in mayonnaise, then it really tastes good. It's probably bad for you. Spit it out. Anyway, the the thing is that that the Stoics really believe that 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 you you shouldn't take pleasure out of anything because it it disturbs the mind. And so the mind was all that mattered. You know, if you think about, if you ever watched science fiction, you know, probably the closest thing to that in science fiction that you maybe saw on TV was the character of Mr. Spock. Mr. Spock is a Vulcan who has no emotions. Uh, he, doesn't, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't get involved in, 
in, in, in, in pleasure is all about this right here. It's all about the mind. And, and, and real happiness is getting rid of all emotions and, and all pleasure and everything else to the point where neoplatonists, who are also philosophers there, who agree with the Stoics in some sense, the, the body is bad. The created world is bad. It's a mistake. And so what they would tend to believe is that, is that in the beginning, if you know anything about, about Greek understandings of gods, there, there, there was one god who created everything, but he really hates human, human beings, and he, and, he, and he hates the earth, and he hates all, all this other stuff because it was an accident. You know, and, and, and what's created was, was evil, and it trapped our souls in these bodies. And the best thing that can happen to you is that you die and then your your soul is released and you can go back to being God. Because we're all little gods trapped in these bodies. By the way, the Mormons teach that. Okay, and that's Mormonism. Alright? So that that and that is something that comes out of Greek philosophy and Gnosticism. Later on it's Gnosticism. Okay. That your your bodies are bad. Your soul is good, but your soul uh, is is just the mind. There's no emotion to it. There's none of that other stuff. It takes no pleasure in anything. It's all about being completely detached from anything having to having to do with pleasure. So what you're going to find, and we're going to see this, is that both of these have a real problem with the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Epicureans have a problem with the gospel of Jesus Christ because the gospel of Jesus Christ has a moral code. All right? In other words, you don't live here just to yuck it up and take in all the pleasure. Every pleasure you have actually points you to the Almighty, and you're supposed to be living a holy life and honoring Him. And when you get to heaven, your chief pleasure is to be in His presence and to have that relationship with Him. Every pleasure on earth is actually supposed to be pointing you to God. And they give him the thanks and the praise and the honor and the worship. Okay. For the Stoics, the idea that God raised a body from the dead and redeemed the creation was absolutely unheard of. That's why when, when Paul was talking about the resurrection of the dead, Jesus in particular, Mary the mocked him. Because of their philosophy, they're like, oh, no way. God would never raise a, a body. We're going to find out that's a real problem uh, in, 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 uh, in, in preaching the gospel to the Greeks. Because it's Greek. The Roman Empire was Roman by conquest, but it was Greek in thought, most of it. And so the Greek thought uh, that permeated it was, was very secular. And because the Greek gods and really all the pagan gods were demons that, that, were, that were ultimately there tormenting them, the, the primary reason that Greek philosophy created secularism okay, was that they, they wanted to have power over the demons that were tormenting them. And they thought the only power was us who could do that. That's why they say man is the measure of all things. I'm not listening to the gods. I'm deciding. Well, that's fine if you're talking about demons. But when you're rebelling against the Almighty, that's something entirely different. Okay? So, understand that, that he's in the middle of, of, of where all these philosophies came from. And they're worshipping all kinds of things. But you know, when, when, when they were worshipping these deities, they weren't worshiping them uh, because these deities loved them. They were worshiping because they were, in a sense, trying to make sure that they left them alone, essentially. Okay? By the way, a, a perfect example of that can be found, and I, I, I saw this in, in the reservation down here at Spirit Lake. All right? 
I ran into a man where they do the sun dance and they propitiate their 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 their, their gods. The reason they propitiate them is because they're hoping that these people will accept their gift and leave them alone. Because these demons torment them. They don't call them demons. They call them by their names. But all pagan religion is like that. It's essentially, I'm going to propitiate you so that you leave us alone. Or maybe you'll go torment my enemies. But we don't, we, we, we're, we're going to basically negotiate here so that if there's any good I can get, that's fine. But I want you to leave me alone, essentially. Because you're bad for me. They all do that. That's an odd thing, isn't it? But that's basically what you get when you're in an abusive situation. You ever think about uh, what happens with spouses and families where you've got a, 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 a guy or a gal that's abusing the family? What do you start doing? Negotiating. I'll give you this, honey, as long as you leave us alone. That's, that's what they were doing. They weren't worshipping like, say, the Israelites were. Or later on, the Christians, because they didn't God that really loved them. These gods didn't love them. That they're quite likely to attack them and hurt them. That's why all the sacrifices and that's why all the all the many different deities, because maybe you can pit one against another. And keep yourself from being hurt. So understand these philosophies. And all these pain, all that paganism has is a, a lot of its, its its roots right there, right there, and that's what he's dealing with. Okay. But do they all believe we have a soul, both the Epicureans and the Stoics? Even they, though they didn't believe in the body, but they all believe we have a soul. Yes, but the Epicureans would tend to believe that your soul goes to Hades, and then that's it. That there's no pleasure in the afterlife. So get it all now. I mean, there were exceptions. Uh, and then the Stoics tend to believe that you need to be re-released from this creation causes a mistake. Pleasure bad. So that's why they didn't believe in the resurrection of the body, just the soul? Goes because away? only the soul must go. But the body, mm -mm. And in fact, let's look at that because this is an important point that I wanted to get into. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, if you will. <coughs> Hey, Tom. Evening. Welcome. Thank you. First Corinthians 15. <coughs> now, I'm going to start the first verse. Actually, I'll, um, I'll tell you what. Vicki, I'm going to have you, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, if you will read verses 1 through 11, please. And then uh, Jack, th this Jack. Thank you. Young Jack. <laughs> Young Jack. Oh, Elder Jack. <laughs> All right. Um, if you will read um, verses 12 through 19. Okay. Well, I should go to 20. Go to 20, first one. All right. All right, go ahead. Okay. Now, brothers. I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. Okay, now this is important because it's going to tell you what the gospel is, and if you don't believe it, then you have no salvation. These are the essentials for being saved. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born. 
For I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether, then, it was I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believe. All right, so let's, let's look at the essentials here. The essentials for salvation is that Christ died for your sins in accordance with the scripture. That he was buried, all right, that his body went to the tomb. And that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scripture. The body that was buried is now raised up, okay? And that he appeared to Cephas and the twelve and to the other. So, and the reason the appearances are important you know, there are two things that are important, and they're in order. The first one, and we've talked about this before, is that all of this was in accordance with the scriptures. In other words, God fulfills his word. If you see anything that isn't according to his word, it isn't God. Okay? That doesn't mean it has to be a quote from every Bible verse, but what it does mean is it has to, it has to go along with what God has said. Okay? The second thing, though, is because it, 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 it affords with the scriptures, God says in the law of Moses, and Jesus again says in the New Testament, that let the truth be confirmed by two or three witnesses. So you have to have a witness. And there wasn't just one. God made sure there were multitudes of witnesses, including, by the way, some of the enemies of Jesus. So that people will know that this thing is the real deal. That he did die, that he was buried, and that he was raised from the dead. Okay? If you do not believe that Jesus died for your sins, if you do not believe that he was raised from the dead, then you are not saved. It's as simple as that. that that's the basis for the gospel. Alright, now let's, let's, let's continue on. Uh, the Jehovah Witnesses do not believe that Jesus died really, but that it appeared that he died. Actually, the Muslims believe that too. All right, um, and that Jesus was not the Son of God, but he was a a uh, the Archangel Michael. Yeah, the Mormons believe that Jesus did not die for all of your sins, only for some. And, and while they believe that he rose from the dead, uh, they also believe uh, that Jesus is uh, Jesus is a God, Father is God, and so are you. So we're all the same. They also believe that he's the brother of Satan. He's the brother of Satan. No, Satan is a God. And they, and they believe they believe in many gods because actually the God is God the Father was was uh, became a, a, a god because he believed in the god before him, and so there are many gods and many many goddesses because that's why it's important to be married in the Mormon temple because if you're married in the Mormon temple, then the, the wife will become a heavenly mother one day, and the husband will become a heavenly father, and then you'll have spirit children, and then you'll have your own plans that you'll populate. Yeah, so that. That and that's all. That's all part of that whole Mormonism deal. All right. All right. Go ahead, dude. Now, if Christ claimed that he raised from the dead. How can some of you say that there is no res resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testify about God that he raised Christ whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead were not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are 
of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Okay, thank you. See, now what Paul is saying to the Corinthians, the Corinthians are a, a predominantly Greek Gentile church. Okay? And what he's showing them is that they're being logically inconsistent. All right? They will acknowledge that Jesus is raised from the dead, and yet they have people going around the congregation saying, oh, there's no resurrection of the dead. Why? Because they still have this philosophy running around their head that says that your body isn't worth redeeming. And so God's not going to redeem it. And so what, what Paul is saying, well, no, if there's no resurrection of the dead, then I have a crisis raised. Or if he's not raised, then we're all going to hell. Because his resurrection is a confirmation by the Father that that sacrifice has been accepted for you and for me. So, so what he's saying is that you need to get the garbage out of your head. And the garbage that was in their head was this Neoplatonism and Stoicism. And some of them were Epicureans as well because we'll find out that they were you know, also doing all kinds of sexual sin and getting drunk and doing these other things. So you have both of those philosophies running around their mind. But the long and the short of it is that the Stoics were saying, there is no resurrection of the dead, can't happen. And these people, even though they saw miracles, so they believed, because they saw Jesus actually do it. For miracles, wonders, and signs, they still had the garbage in their head, which sometimes kept them from being consistent with their life. By the way, let me just say this right now. That's not, that, that's not unique to them. That's not what? It's not unique oh. to the Greeks. When you look at every type of people, all right, doesn't matter what race they are, doesn't matter what, what group they come from, when we all come to Christ, when we know that we know that we know that Jesus is alive, we're born again, we're filled with the Spirit, it is awesome. But that doesn't mean there isn't garbage in your head that needs to get out. It's a lifetime of getting rid of it. Because let's, 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 let's be honest, we, we live in a, in a world where we're bombarded with garbage 24-7. That's why, by the way, we need to be in the Word regularly. That's why we need to be in the, in the company of the saints. That's why we need to be in church. That's why we need to worship. That's why we need to be in prayer. Because we all have that, a, a, a philosophy that we've agreed with that really isn't consistent with the gospel. And we'll go ahead and act on that even though it's inconsistent with what we say we believe. We're all guilty of that from time to time. So just, just so you know, this is what's going on in Athens. He's getting this kind of opposition because what Jesus did on the cross, what God has been doing through him, is totally inconsistent with what they've been believing. For one, it means holiness of life. The Epicureans don't want to hear that. For the Stoics, it means the redemption of the body and the whole creation. They don't want to hear that either. All right. Any questions? Any more questions about that? All right. Well, let's look here. There's something else we're going to need to look at. It's interesting that Paul speaks to them about what they should already know about God. He calls it the un he says, we have an altar that's to the unknown God. So I'm here to preach to you the one whom you don't know. And then he goes on to say, but you really do know. Because the fact of the matter is that even in your own philosophy and in your own poets, You've said these very things. For example, if you look here at verse 28, it 
you'll find that he says this. Paul, Paul is quoting from two Greek poets. In him, in God, we live and move and have our being. Okay, and that's probably from Epimenides of Crete. Not a Jew, certainly not a Christian, those Christians were around them. But a Gentile that had a revelation. Okay? Uh, and then also, and even as some of your old poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. And that's from Aratus' poem, uh, Philomena. Philomena. Okay? What he's saying here then is that, you know, you're saying that you don't know God, but the fact of the matter is you don't even have that excuse. Because you were, you, you, you've been pointed to God over and over and over again. And what, what, what St. Paul is, is making clear to them is something that he writes in Romans chapter 1 later on. And that is that no one has an excuse before God to say, I didn't know. Because I didn't know. It's not, it's not that they didn't have the truth. It's that they suppressed it. And there's a difference between not knowing and suppressing. I'll give you an example. All right. Let's say, let's say that that um, and this this actually happened. Uh, let's say that uh, this hypothetical way has it's happened in real life. Um, that I go to a family reunion one day, and I find out that I have a brother from the same father but a different mother before my mom and my dad got, got married. And I didn't know it. I just find out. Okay? That's not knowing. Okay? So I didn't send him a Christmas card and I didn't send him this other stuff. Well, I can't be all responsible because I don't know it. I don't know it. Never heard of it. Okay? But let's say that I that, that, that I, I, I did know. But I just suppressed that responsibility. I know, but I'm gonna pretend he's not there. So I ruin that relationship altogether. I'm still responsible. I know. I'll just ignore it. Okay? And we'll, we'll, we'll see this here. Let's look at Romans chapter 1. Starting in verse 18. And uh, maybe I'll have you uh, read that. Romans chapter 1. Okay. And uh, maybe if you'll read... Verses 18 through 23. There's much more, but we only need to really deal with that right now. 18 through 23. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godliness, godlessness, and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them, for since the creation of the world... God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. Okay. So what, what it says here very plainly is that the world knows. But they, they've suppressed that truth. Because 
rather than give glory to the Creator. By the flesh, they serve giving glory to the created things. And that's something that we, we find throughout, throughout pagan religions. And what's interesting, too, is that when you look, you know, one of the things that, that I found interesting, because I was actually talking to somebody who knows this, um, secular archaeologists, especially those that are in universities, they absolutely hate it when missionaries show up someplace before they do. You know why they hate it? Because these missionaries start writing down the stories of the people that they meet, the indigenous peoples. All right? And now we'll make sure I get this right. In every case where missionaries have gotten there before archaeologists, the story is different than what they teach in universities. Because in universities, what they teach is this. They teach an evolution of, 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 of human uh, coming to the knowledge of a god. All right? Started out that we were basically just spiritists. And then we started worshiping uh, after we animus, or worshiping trees and, and all these other stuff. Then we got higher and we started worshiping uh, personalities, you know, in, the, in the, 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 the forces of nature. And then finally, we, 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 we thought, great idea. Weren't we smart? Of having one God. We thought that up. We did. That's, that's what they want us to believe. All right? On the other hand, when, when, when missionaries are actually writing down the stories of these people, you know what they find out? That in the beginning, they all believed in one God. One. But they quickly started worshiping the spirits of the world and became animists and worshiping the force of nature and, and doing human sacrifice and all of that. In fact, actually, if you go to a um, uh, Ohio or some of these other places where you see where uh, the, the Indians of that place were building the mounds, the mounds actually look like, uh, well, I'll just show it to you, okay? Can I tell you what my shop for? You don't really need to bury me with it, but you know. No, you say you want that. Okay, I'll take it. <laughs> so right, so when so so when the resurrection comes, my body comes up, and I still can't take it with me. <laughs> All right. Anyway, this part we're done with. When we did that last time, but I just want to show this to you because it was a we were. I was, I was visiting with, with someone who did great studies on this. And it reminded me of something that we find in Genesis. The mound people there built these, these mounds. And what they did is they would have right here an altar that was there. Okay? And it would be encircled by these mounds, but then there would be an opening that come out there. So you're looking from the top down? From the top down. Okay. What it, what it actually is, is it's a womb. Mm -hmm. All right? And they would have sexual relations there in the hope of producing what in the, in the Old Testament is called the Nephilim. Where you invite the evil spirits in, and you create basically a a uh, a, a, a man with supernatural power, demonic power. Okay, this is something that you find clearly in Genesis. Now, somebody might ask, well, how did they do that after the flood? We need to remember that you had three families come off of there. Okay, I mean, I'm not counting Noah, but I mean. His sons and their families came off that ark. All of them knew God, but all of them also knew the religion of the past that he was crushing by the flood. And what appears to have happened very quickly 
is that they all went from worshiping God to going right back into the sin of the past. And they taught their children to do the same. Not surprising because it, when, when the flood was over, you know what you know what God said? He said he saw that the human heart was continuously wicked. Mm -hmm. Even after the flood. So understand that what 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 we're being taught in our university is wrong. That's not anything new when it comes to these things. Alright. And the fact of the matter is that all of all of human history points to the truth that there was one time they believed in God and they fell away rather quickly and went right back into the religions of, of, the, uh, of their ancestors or their neighbors. And actually, uh, you know, this is in the Mao people, but you know what? They did that in the temples of Baal in the Middle East, in, 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 the, in the temples of Egypt, Rome, Greece. China. This is not anything that's unique to them. It's something that again spread rather rapidly. So what Paul is saying to them is that, you know, yeah, you don't know what you really do. Because I'm going to show you that even your own poets, who you actually quote in this here place called the Areopagus, they knew it. You know it. Plato talked about there being only one God. You know that's true. See, the problem with Gentiles, throughout the Bible, up until the New Testament, the problem with the Gentiles was not that they didn't know that Israel's God was a God. They knew that. They couldn't help but know that. But they would never except for various individuals as a whole the one thing they could never bring themselves to do was declare that he is the only God they were always worshipping other things and what got Israel exiled from the land was that here God had brought a people into the land out of captivity spoken to them with his own voice done things in front of them that none of these pagan gods can ever begin to do. And yet, in the end, they were behaving just like the Gentiles and saying, yeah, Yahweh is God and we'll sure go to the temple when we meet him. But we're also going to hang out over here in the temple of Baal and worship these other ones just in case. And what that means then is that they got severely punished, and actually Jesus says this, to whom much is given, much is required. They were God's chosen people for this. And so the punishment that came on that was absolutely exquisite. Because they, they ended up having a curse follow them throughout the lands, wherever they were at, until now when they're being brought back into, the, into their own land. And that's the thing we need to remember. Israel got punished because they knew better. That only God is God. Everything else is a demon. And yet they behave like the Gentiles. Let that be a warning for the church. See, we don't have any business warming up, cozying up to any other, quote, God. You know, there are... There are uh, Within, within a number of our, our denominations, there, there is a move that's called Chrislam. C-H-R-I-S-L-A-M. Chrislam. Where, where they, are, they, are, they are equating Jesus with Allah. And they will actually have Qurans in the views where they are actually uh, worshiping, they're really worshiping Allah. They're not worshiping Jesus. But they'll throw Jesus a bone. So understand, this is going on. We don't have any business doing that. 
And if God did not spare the people of Israel, what do you think he's going to do with the church? So that's why it's very important for us to be clear. All right? We do know who God is. And we're not supposed to move away from that. And we're not supposed to allow garbage in our head to take over, but we need to constantly be in the Word so that we can cleanse our mind of filth and be focused on what God wants. And again, that's called sanctification in the Bible, and in our churches we call that sanctification. It's the process of being made holy. And that takes time. You know, I, I, somebody gave me this analogy, and I think it's really cool, because it's a farm analogy, and some of you guys who are farmers, you know this. I didn't realize this either. But you know, those rocks that you pick, there are more rocks underneath than that. And, and they just keep coming up. And you can pick those rocks, and next year, where did that boulder come from? I just picked a boulder right there last year. What is, it that, what is this, the size of Texas? You know, and you feel like you're, 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 you're pulling Mount Everest out of there. You know? But the earth keeps pushing up these rocks. Okay? And, and really, you have to get in there and pick them out if anything's going to be planted and actually take root. That's what God does to our souls. Many times he will make those rocks come up and we have to pick them. There might be unbelief in there. It has to go. There might be doubt in there. It has to go. There might be unforgiveness in there. It has to go. Those rocks have to be picked out. And it's a continuous job that we're never done with until, guess what? We either go home to heaven or the Lord comes before, before we die. Okay? That's what we need to do. Somebody, they, they told me that about fell out of my chair. I said, wow, that's cool. <coughs> Excuse me. And I did not know that. I didn't realize that. That they, it was because of pushing up more rocks. Pastor. Yeah. We're cheating a little bit. How's that? We roll them every spring on the beans. Push <laughs> <laughs> them down again. They put them back down. They put them back down. A little way. A little way. <laughs> All right, well, I will tell them. But... No. <laughs> Well, maybe you should, because there's a lot of it going on. <laughs> <laughs> um, just a little more on this subject. I, I don't want to. I just read a really interesting book. It was fiction, but it was about a little girl. Her parents were, were killed, and she was two. And her grandfather, she went to live with her grandfather, who was a trapper in the wilderness up in Alaska, or in Canada. Well, they had, he had, a, she had, a native, he had a Native American friend that helped him raise her. And so he homeschooled her, and she was exposed to a lot of the gods that the natives believed. Mm -hmm. And she grew up always with a sense of never feeling comfortable. She loved nature. Mm -hmm. You know, she, she knew that something greater than had created nature. Mm -hmm. But long story short, she went to a college then, and she met a Christian friend mm -hmm. who, who gave her all the answers. And she, was, and she learned about Jesus. But it's made me think about that book in that if you aren't ever told about Jesus, you can still have a sense of God and creation. Mm -hmm. But do they have that peace? They, they don't. You don't. But they are saved. If they if they believe that a God created the no, world and the universe. Not. That is so hard. That's why you need Jesus. What about what about parts of the earth that never Well, let me just I'll just tell you I'll just tell you what Jesus says. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teach them to observe everything I command you. And lo, I am with you always to the end of the earth. He never, ever, ever, ever says, well, there's an exception for this group over here. Yeah. Yeah. He doesn't say that. Now, by the way, that doesn't mean that I'm running around saying, oh, you know, they're all, you're all, you're all going to hell. Uh, because the, the message is, is, look, get saved. Get saved. But the, the, the long and the short of it is that, yes, if you don't have Jesus, then you're lost. You have to have him. The reason you have to have him is because every human being, oh, oh, let me rephrase that. There's some people who are atheists. But actually, even atheists, strangely enough, even atheists have spiritual experiences. 
because we live in a spiritual world. And what's fascinating is that in, in Russia, for example, there are a lot of atheists there. They want nothing to do with church. They want nothing to do with God. On the other hand, they do go see their witch in the media because they, 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 they believe in spirits. They just won't believe in, in God. A lot of spiritual experiences go on. But we absolutely have to have Jesus. And the reason we have to have Jesus is for precisely the fact that unless we are cleansed of our sin and awakened by the Holy Spirit, we are all lost. Because our sin separates us from God. We're rebels. And we absolutely have to have that relationship restored. And the only one who does that is Jesus. There is no other way. That's why Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes from the Father as sent by me. And it's a reminder that in John 14, where he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Okay? He uses the definite article there. The, and in the Greek, that's very strong. It means I am the only way. The only truth, the only life. So, let me just say, right, right there, that if anyone is lost, it's a terrible shame. It's horrible. At the same time, that's why we need Jesus. And actually, let's, let's look at it this way, too. All right? Even in the past, okay, before Jesus was on the cross, before he was born, okay, how were people saved? By faith. Oh, yeah. By faith. By faith. And what they were believing, and, and this is where it's important to read Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11. All right. They were saved by faith. And what's interesting is it was, it was not faith in the law, per se, but in faith of what the law was pointing to. And that is they were saved in their faith that Messiah was coming. That he was going to take away their sins. But they died without going to heaven. You know where they went? Paradise. Paradise. They went to paradise. Which was in, in, in the realm of Sheol, which is found in the Old Testament. All right. But it was the place of the godly, the godly departed. But they weren't in heaven yet. They weren't in the presence of God yet. They were comforted. They were doing much better than they were on earth but they still weren't the presence of God yet. That's what Jesus is talking about, by the way, and I believe it's Luke 18, when he is talking about Lazarus and, and the rich man. The rich man goes to hell and is tormented, and then there's, a, there's a, an abyss, and then the Lazarus is taken by the angels into the bosom of Abraham. Not to the throne of the Almighty, into the bosom of Abraham. Now, what we learn, though, is that there were saved people who believed in Messiah, that he was coming. What we find is that after the cross, Jesus, what happened to him? He descended to the dead. Which actually in Hebrew is Sheol. He descended there. We, we read that he proclaimed his victory and that he when he ascended, he would let many out. Who was he leading out? Those who had believed in his coming, but had not entered into heaven yet. Okay? Why were they there? Because the sacrifice had not been made yet. Their faith saved them from hell, but the sacrifice of Jesus had not been made yet. So they could not enter into the presence of the Father. But now that his blood had been shed, the eternal life of God shed, they were now rewarded by their faith and went to be at, 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 in the third heaven with God. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, what we find then is that paradise is no longer in Sheol. It's in heaven. That's where the godly 
going out. Those who believe in Jesus are there in the glory of the Father. And so Sheol was only a place of torment now. It's only a place where, where, where the damned go. But I want you to notice something. The same conditions apply both before Jesus and after Jesus. It was faith in the Messiah that Jesus would come. And by the way, that promise did not begin with Israel. It began with Adam and Eve. Which means that promise was given to every human being. But only those who believed would receive it. You know where that promise is, right? Let's look at it. Genesis chapter 3. It actually is God speaking to the serpent, to the, to the devil. And I start Genesis chapter 3. And I'm going to start at verse 14. Verse 14. Right. Okay, everybody there? All right. Okay, God is speaking to the serpent. And this is what, after Adam and Eve had eaten the fruit, and, and, and God has confronted them. Now come the curses. This is what, what God does. And God curses Satan first. He gets the curse first. All right. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. By the way, um, the word dust here doesn't mean that serpents eat dust because actually they don't. Okay? But remember, what were Adam and Eve, what, what was Adam made out of? Dust. The dust. What it means now is that because of, of this rebellion and Adam and Eve forfeited their dominion, now Satan is going to rule. He's going to rule until the coming of the Messiah. He's, this world, St. Paul calls Satan the God of this world. In other words, everybody who's not a believer actually worships this thing, and he's actually in charge of much of the world that's going on. Okay. Dust here means that he has now been given dominion for a brief period over human beings. Okay. They are, because of their sin nature, they're open to the attack of the enemy. They're not protected. They're open. All right. Now, verse 15. I will put enmity between you and the woman. And between your offspring, or actually, it should actually read your seed and her seed. Okay. The reason that I'm saying seed here is because seed there is singular. We're talking about one particular person. Now what will he do? He shall bruise your head, and you shall, uh, yeah, he, you shall, he shall crush your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Okay, understand, that is the promise of the coming of the Messiah. Why? First of all, you have here, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between her seed and your seed. Very important for us to see this. Throughout the Old Testament, whenever we're talking about the seed of someone, it's the seed of the man. The seed of Abraham. The seed of Jesse, the seed of David. All the way here is it talking about the seed of the woman. Why? Because it's the man that gives the seed. The, the, literal, the literal word here is where we, in, in the Greek, is actually what we call, what we get the, 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 the term sperm. Okay? That's where it comes from. It's the seed. Alright? 
And what this is saying then is that there's coming a time when a woman will have a seed in her. It didn't come from a man. It's a supernatural seed. Who do you think that is? Is 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 Jesus by the Holy Spirit? Okay. Who's the woman? Mary. Mary. And that seed will come out, and he will be the Messiah, and he will be the one who crushes Satan's head and restores the dominion that was lost to the human race. He's, he's also, therefore, our kinsman redeemer. In the Bible, a kinsman redeemer is a brother. It, it, first of all, it has to be male. He has to be a close blood relative. He has to be able to pay the price for your redemption. And he has to be willing to pay the price. When Jesus, who is the Son of God, became a human being as beginning at the sea and moving on, that was on purpose because God the Father was sending Jesus as our kinsman redeemer. He is our blood brother. And therefore, he has the authority as the Redeemer, because he can pay, and he's willing to pay. He has the authority to release those who are under an oppressive power, the enemy, and restore them to their inheritance. That's what a kinsman Redeemer does. A kinsman Redeemer also kills the murderer. Who's the murderer? Satan. Jesus is our kinsman Redeemer. So this is the, the, the first prophecy of the coming of the Messiah. And it was made for all people. It was going to, it was going to happen through Israel. But before Israel came in, before it, ever Israel came into being, that promise was already there for every human being. And by the way, somebody might, understand, might, might ask, well, did, 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 did Adam and Eve understand that, that this Messiah was coming? The answer is yes, they did. Because when Cain was first born, and Martin Luther, uh, who, did a, a, who was doing translations on this, went to the Hebrew, and he said the Hebrew clearly states when, 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 um, when Eve was saying, I have, I, have, I have had a man, there was that hope that this was the Messiah who would crush the serpent's head. It wasn't. He was a murderer instead. But they, they certainly had the understanding that this promise was about the coming of the Messiah, the Christ. So understand then that the message, the promise, Vicki, of the Messiah was already there. So that's why Again, nobody has an excuse. They suppress the truth. It's not the truth wasn't there. In, oh, sorry. Go ahead. In verse 15, it says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers, or your seed and yep. hers. So, what are they referring to as far as the offspring of Satan? Yep. Well, that would be, remember what Jesus said in, um, well, let's look at that. John chapter 8. Start at verse 39. Actually, I'm going to start verse 34. Okay. By the way, Jesus is about to say something that's very offensive to a lot of people here. Can we accept that Jesus says offensive things? He does. But he's also telling the truth. Okay? Start at verse 34, chapter 8. Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. And if the son sets you free, you'll be free indeed. Again, another 
another uh, uh, another revelation that he's the redeemer. He, he will buy you back out of slavery. That's what he's there to do. Okay. I know that you are the offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. I speak of what I've seen with my father, and you do what you have heard from your father. They answered him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you are Abraham's children, you would be doing the works Abraham did. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that, that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. You are doing the works of your, that your father did. And they said to him, We are not born of sexual immorality. We have one father, even God. Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I came from God and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are of your father, who? The devil. the devil. Or Satan. All right? And your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and has nothing to do with the truth because there is no truth in him. Where he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. I'll just stop right there. Okay? What you have here then is that Jesus is making it very clear there are two kinds of people in the world. Just two. You're either, your father is either God or your father is the devil. And the basis for being, having God as your father is what? The relationship with Jesus Christ as the son who redeems you. Otherwise, you are of the devil. You may not think you are, but that's what you are. Now the good news is this. Because Jesus died for our sins, was raised from the dead, and sent his church out with the Holy Spirit, there are lots of people who are of the devil who when they hear the good news, the Holy Spirit changes. And they become what? Instantly. Children of God. Okay? And by the way, that's why John chapter 1 is very important. Let's look at that real quickly. Right. Chapter 1, verse 9. Let's start there. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. Again, a reminder that Jesus is God. He's the Lord. Okay. Yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But, thank God for the but, to all who did receive him, who believe in his name, he gave the right, and actually the word here also means the authority, to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. We're talking about the new birth here, being born of him. That only comes by water and the Spirit. So, when that happens, when faith comes, then that person becomes a new creation. Because they're in Christ Jesus. So, the, 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 the offspring of the devil are all those who reject God. And in particular, reject God through his son, Jesus. Because the Messiah has, it's, in, it's within the context of what God is saying to the serpent, that the Messiah will come and crush you. All right? So if you're with the Lord, you're a child of God. If you're not with him, you're a child of the devil. Is there any question there, Vicki? Yes. This is why I love Bible study. Yeah, amen. <laughs> well, that's why we have it. Amen. Are there any other questions before we move forward on this? No. 
You know, Pastor, I, I think uh, it can be said that there's probably, I doubt if there's a place in the world now that hasn't had the opportunity to hear God's Word. Uh, I know when I talk about uh, talk about the Muslim world, for example, mm. which covers a lot of the earth out here, where there are no Christians there. Well, Christians have been there, yeah. but they they were killed mm. over time. But the opportunity was there, yeah. and I, and I think that is I don't know a place where it isn't now, but that hasn't been the case. So. Well, and I, I, I will offer this, because you know, the, the, the thing to remember, because I, I'm always reminded of this. I'm reminded of it in my own witness, I mean, in my own testimony, not my own life. Uh, I praise Jesus and my Father in heaven, that he is so much kinder and better to me than I deserve, and so much better than I imagined. And when I think about some of the Muslims, who became Christians because the Lord just showed up and changed their heart. And now they're, now they're, now they're preaching Jesus as the Son of God, as a Savior to other Muslims. Uh, God, the, the one thing that I want to I, I stress is that while it is true, absolutely true, that before you come to Christ, you're of the devil. He really, truly loves the human race. And he really, truly desires that all men should be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. That doesn't mean that all people will be saved. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying what the Bible says, that it is his desire that all people should reach repentance that leads to life. And so I'm so grateful that he's just that good. He's far better to us than we deserve. I mean, I mean that. I say that about myself. He's far better than we deserve. Far better than I deserve. I'm so grateful for, for that grace. But the one thing we need to be aware of is that grace always calls us into obedience, into holiness, into faith, into walking away from the world and walking towards God. That, that's what all that's about. So anyone who says to you, well, grace means I can live my life the way I see fit. Yeah, no, it doesn't. <laughs> it never meant that. And in fact, if that's what you're thinking, I, I doubt that you've actually met the grace of God. Because once I met the grace of God, I look back on my old life, and, I, you know, and I, it was like what St. Paul says. It's rubbish. It's garbage. I don't want to do with that. Well, what's that for? Ugh. So, there's far better waiting for us. Now, on, on that line, I want us to look at this here because we're we're just going to deal with this and I think we'll we'll close. But if you look at verses 29 through uh, through 30. And um, Kobe, will you read that for us, please? Uh, I'm sorry, Acts 17. I'm sorry, Acts 17. Yeah, we've been through the Bible a lot, but it's Acts 17. Acts 17. Verses 29, 29 to 30. But, by the way, you know what we call water? There's another name for it now. I'm going to mark it. No, no, no. But, but, but. But what, what's, what's, what's coffee in, in, in Spanish? Cafe. Okay. Cafe? So, so in Spanish, what you mark it is Cafe Zero. Oh, no. <laughs> or Coffee Zero. Yeah. It's water. Oh. <laughs> Just like you have Coke Zero. Coke and... Zero. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But that was just an aside. There's no one else to charge for that. Okay. <laughs> see, actually, actually, what that is is, is the advertising that isn't going to go on the YouTube one. That sometimes you put those that little advertisements on there. This video has been presented to you by Coffee Zero. <laughs> <laughs> 
Hmm, yum. Okay. <laughs> Right. <laughs> All right. Let's go to verse 29. Uh, uh, Toby, go ahead. 29 through 30. Please. Uh, uh, through 31. Sorry. 29 through 31. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold, silver, or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance. Now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man has, he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. Okay, thank you. Now, I want you to, I want you to notice uh, a couple of things here. Um, when it says, you know, um, that... that Verse 30. Walk over verse 29. First of all, we're reminded of what? That we're God's offspring. It's a reminder that every human being is made in the image of God. Okay, we're made in the image of God. And what happened though? Because if we're, if we're made in the image of God so that God originally was our father, but now we're rebels, and he's not our father, he's our judge, something happened. It's called sin, rebellion. That happened. And what it says here then is that uh, God is not like anything that you've created or imagined. Okay? He's not that weak. He's much more powerful. And the other thing is that is that he's reminding these people that you know they're they're afraid of their false gods because their false gods are demons who torment them. But what he's saying is that you actually can have a personal relationship with God, and it's a relationship that will lead to eternal life, and it will not be a tormenting kind of relationship, but it will be one of freedom and love and peace and joy. And that's what I'm here to, to tell you about, okay? And the first thing he reminds them is the love of God, and the love of God is this. The times of ignorance, God over what? What that means is that because God is just and because God, God hates sin, uh, he has every right and would have had every right to just wipe us out right away. Okay? And yet he did not do that. He had patience and forbearance with the human race. Okay? And then we find this. But now, again, there's a but. But now, he commands all people everywhere to repent. What's repentance mean? What was it mean? Okay, well, it, it, it can lead to the forgiveness of sins. Or forgiveness of sins can lead to repentance. But repentance is something else. Turning away from sin. All right, it's turning away from sin. Now, you can be forgiven and then repent, or you can repent and then be forgiven. It works either way. But nevertheless, uh, repentance is something else. It means a turning away from sin. It also means, in the Greek, it means a changing of your mind, changing of your attitude. If you, were, you were thinking the wrong thing, you had a wrong attitude, and now you're, you're going to turn away from that, and you're going to think God's way. You're going to have God's attitude. All right? So in the Hebrew, it means literally, I was walking in sin, now I'm turning 180 degrees away from that and going back to God. So that your lifestyle changes. Okay? So really, if you're going to understand what repentance is, you need to understand both the Greek and the Hebrew. The Greek talks about changing your mind and your attitude, and the Hebrew is about actually doing something. In other words, I make a decision, and I put that decision into action. And, and the, the best example that Jesus gives about that is in the parable of the prodigal son. See, in the parable of the prodigal son, this guy decides, I want my inheritance now. And he went, and he squandered it on reckless living. He did all kinds of things he shouldn't have done. And then a famine hit the land, and he hired himself out 
to someone who gave him uh, the job of feeding the pigs. All right? And, and, and for a Jew to be feeding pigs was an unclean job. On top of that, he lost all his inheritance, and now you had a, a foreigner over him. And this foreigner never gave him anything. Promised him great many things, but didn't give him anything. In this parable, who do you think that foreigner is? An image of? The devil. Okay? So he's now bound to the enemy. But God allows him to be there for a while. You know why? Because in that moment, he started to change his mind. He started thinking about his father. And about how his father's servants always had enough to eat. And then, and then, he, real, and then he made a decision. You know what the decision was? I am going to leave. And I'm going to return to my father's house. And I'm going to say to my father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Hire me as one of your servants. But that's not enough. You know what else he did? Jesus says this. And so he got up and went. So repentance is not only making the decision. It's getting up and acting. So repentance has to have both of those attached to it. No sense making a decision that you're not going to act on. You know, one of my one of my examples I give is the fact that Rachel is going to be 18 next year. When she was like two or three, somebody was nice enough to give her a, a, a little coat wrap with her name on it. And Debbie and I made a decision. It's going to go right there. She's almost 18. And I'm just going to give that to her to hang up in her own place now. <laughs> because it hasn't gone on the wall. <laughs> it isn't there. So what, what difference did that decision make? We made a decision and did nothing. Made no difference. That's why, you know, when you make a decision, the only way that people know about your decision and, not, and, and that it makes a difference is when you act on it. Right? That's what repentance is. So God is saying, look, it's time for all of you to make the decision about my son Jesus. And then to act on it. To turn away from your sin. Turn back to me. And if you confess your sin, then I am faithful and just to forgive your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And the blood of Jesus will cleanse us and make us new. All right, so that's that's what we need to see. The time now is for salvation, and that requires people to repent, to turn away, and to rethink their lives in the light of Jesus and the gospel and the scriptures. Now we also find this, verse thirty-one, because he, that's the Father, has fixed a day on which. He will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. The resurrection of Jesus means two things. One, I mean, it means more than two things. I'm just going to bring up two things. One, it means that the sacrifice that was made for you and for me has been accepted by the Father. So when we believe in Jesus, and we come to Him, we're baptized in His name, we have eternal life. That sacrifice has been accepted, we're forgiven, we're cleansed, the Holy Spirit can come, and we are a new creation. We're no longer under His judgment, but we are under His grace. Okay? That's what that means. But it also means something else. Here, St. Paul says, the resurrection means that Jesus is the judge. And he's coming. Because one thing we need to remember is that Jesus is a king. Is he the king? He's the king. Well, in, 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 in the Bible, and, and, and in, uh, at the time of David, and even at this time, a king wasn't somebody like Queen Elizabeth who went in a car 
and went like this to the to the to the to the photographers. <laughs> <laughs> She, you know, she's a figurehead. All right, wasn't like the European king. Wasn't even like, like, like the dictators. All right, a king was also the Supreme Court judge. All the problems came to him, and then he dealt out the justice based on God's word. He was supposed to anyway. Jesus is going to judge the world. By the way, he's going to judge the world according to this word. This one. So, it's going to be a righteousness. He's not going to, he's not going to judge based on hearsay because he knows. He knows the heart of every person. And what this is intended to do is to let people know that guess what? Jesus loves us he has compassion on us, but there's also a time where he's going to settle scores. So now is the time to get saved. Because if he should show up and you're not ready, you're standing before his judgment seat condemned. And nobody wants to stand there that way. Because there's no way you're going to stand before the Lord Jesus and say, well, I didn't do it. <laughs> really? We were really? just talking about this this afternoon. Oh, God's going to have that movie screen just showing us everything we nope. did <laughs> wrong. Well, you know, that's oh, I guess I did do that. Yeah, well, actually, actually to, to, to put this kind of in a, in a, in a, in a more humorous tone, all right, it's like it's like it's like the uh, the football player that fumbles the football right before it goes across the goal line, and then he insists, "I made it, I made it," and that's where God says, "Oh, all right, let's look at the instant replay, shall we?" <laughs> Upon further review, we have a fumble by the by the offending player. <laughs> But it also says that once you've repented, it's gone. Right. Once you've repented, you turn to him, all of that's cleansed away. All right? All of that's cleansed away, which is why you need Jesus. Okay? I'll show you one more scripture, and then we'll close, and then we'll go on to chapter 18 next time. But look at Jeremiah 31, 31 and 34. Okay? Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. It's one of my favorite scriptures. I about them. I, I, don't, I don't meditate on this every day, but almost every day. I meditate on this. Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34, because it's talking about the new covenant. It's talking about what Jesus is going to do. Okay, what is the difference between the um, the people of Israel and the people of Judah. Okay, at this time, at this time, uh, when Jeremiah is prophesying, in one sense, when we talk about the people of Israel, we mean all all the tribes. And later on, uh, and, and actually in various places in the in the Old and the New Testament, that's exactly what that means. It means all the tribes. But in this sense. And, and many times during the prophets, what we need to remember is the history of Israel. After Solomon died, his son, uh, Rehoboam, was going to take the throne. And the people of Israel were one at that time. Okay? But they rebelled when Rehoboam said, You know what? My father might have been mean. I'm going to get even meaner. I'm really going to, he was going to, he was going to get the labor going and he was going to, because, you know, Solomon towards the end of his life was not a nice guy. He was actually using slave labor even of Israel, Israelites. And so they were tired of all the, all the oppression. And so they said, if you'll treat us nice, we'll, we'll be your servants. But if you're not, then we don't want nothing to do with you. 
And Rehoboam said, you know what? I'm going to treat you even worse than my dad. I'll show you who's boss. And they broke. And so Judah and Benjamin were really one in one group. And the other tribes were in the other. Now the Levites, who did not have an inheritance, land inheritance, they were thrown out of the northern kingdom of Israel. In fact, they were called the northern kingdom of Israel. That's what they were called. And they went into, the, into Judah. But the, the long and the short of it is that when this Jeremiah is talking about Israel and Judah, God is talking about them. He's talking about that northern kingdom and Judah because they're all one family. But they were separated because of sin. That's why he's talking about these two as political entities. Okay? Because Israel was ruled by a king in Samaria, and Judah and Benjamin were ruled by a king from Jerusalem. That was the house of David, and that was God. Okay? But in the end, God's going to make them both one again, which is what he's doing right now. Okay? Because there are, actually, here's, here's an interesting thing. When the people of Israel, their leadership, were about to declare independence, okay, they were to declare their, their, their right to be a sovereign nation under the United Nations Charter. They had originally thought, well, we'll call ourselves Judah. Because most of the people there had come from the tribe of Judah, so we'll call ourselves Judah. And then at the last minute, almost, they made the decision, no. We're going to call the country Israel, which is a fulfillment of the prophecy. They didn't realize that. But it was a fulfillment of the prophecy that God had made, that he was going to establish them as one nation, no longer two. And they would be called Israel. So even when they don't realize it, God's word is being fulfilled. Okay? So this covenant is for all the people. That's why it's there, Israel and Judah. Okay. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. So what you find here right away is that God is saying, you know, the, the covenant of Moses, is it, I'm going to make a new one because that one was broken by the people of Israel. Not by God, but by them. And now they're under what? They're under a curse. That's what we need to understand. And if he's going to rescue his people from the curse, then there needs to be the shedding of blood and a new covenant. But the shedding of blood is his son who then releases them from the curse because he takes the curse upon himself. Okay. Verse were you reading from? Uh, verse 30, 31 and 32. Okay? So around the verse 33. But we'll all read with each other in prayer. The only thing I ask is that if you're going to pray, pray it loud enough.